Welcome to People of Purpose. People of Purpose. People of Purpose. People of Purpose. People of Purpose is a podcast of inspiring people whose stories help you see things differently, live with intentionality, elevate the way you participate in the world, and take the necessary leaps in your life to seek and find your passions. Come with us and develop the courage to wholeheartedly pursue your purpose and unleash your truest potential. Hello, Kim White. Welcome to the People of Purpose podcast. Lovely to see you here on on our show. Um, Thank you, Tana. It's great to be here. Cool. Yeah, so we just got done chatting a little bit. So I want to pick up some of the things we talked about. It feels like we were about to start an interview, and I'm really happy that we were able to finally press record and get going with this. Um, what, What you do is is incredibly unique. And you have a few different angles of how you do things that I'm really excited to kind of absorb, you know, your wisdom of, I think you've been in the space for like 30 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, It's going to be an incredible journey to kind of learn about how you kind of walked this path and and got committed and started and then what you're doing now. I think our our listeners are in for a treat today. Cool. Look forward to it. (laughs) So... How do you describe what you do and how is that related to your sense of purpose? If, if you're talking to like, you know, a random person on the street or like my dad or, or grandparents or some, someone that doesn't know you, doesn't know anything about your line of work, how do you describe it to an average person? I, the way I describe it is my unique ability is to be able to sense energy. And what I did was I, I, have, I have a unique ability, which is that sensitivity. And then I have my passion, which is about business, sport, um, productivity, human performance. How can we get better as humans? Mm -hmm. How can we improve our lives? So I took the two. I've always been someone who loves to help people. So I just took my unique ability and said, I would just pray and say, God, you know, how can I use this to help people? And so I would just start... um, for years, I would think about, wow, people keep coming to me with their problems, but well, I don't know what to do with it. So it was obviously a, something I had inside. Uh, and uh, and so I just, I was an athlete at the time. What ha- what originally happened that got me into this work was I was, a, I was an athlete, a runner, training for the Olympics, and everything in my training was so precise and controlled. The only variable was where I slept the night before I raced. And I would stay in these different hotel rooms and that, and the different hotel rooms would affect my performance differently. And I was like, this is crazy. Why should our environment affect us? So that's where it all started. And then when I finished uh, my career as a runner and I was, I was uh, graduating from college uh, out in Arizona, I, uh, I thought, let me try this, this system I was learning about how we can change our belief systems let me try it out for a year before I go to graduate school to do my master's. And so I tried it for a year and I never went, <laughs> I never went back to school. It was like, I loved it. From the first week, I just, just got into it and people would come. My first week I had 15 clients. It was amazing. It's just like, okay, this is where I'm meant to be. So that's where, that's where it all started. But it's this whole idea of how can we become better in whatever we choose for our life's journey or as humans, uh, how can we improve? How can we reach our potential? Mm-hmm. And I've, I've, a lot of the situations I help people with are things that I've gone through myself or, mm-hmm. or, or, or experiences that I've worked with others. So, um, yeah, so my gift is, you know, I have, a, I have a real strong connection with God. I'm always praying and asking for help and asking how may I serve? And so it's like, okay, God, how am I serve? How can I help uh, this person? How can I help that person? And then what I, what happens is I start to feel this warmth in my heart. And then I just go, I come down into my heart and then I'm guided from there. My intuition is really good. And I just follow it. I just follow what I'm, how I'm guided. And that's how I, I help people. And of course, I didn't know how to do it. So I would like start, I'd get so many different teachers to teach me different modalities, different techniques of improving our mind, our body, our energy and everything. And just trusting that whatever I'm guided is what I do for, for my clients. So that's beautiful. Yeah. 
when I was doing my homework on you, I, I read the word intuition probably a couple dozen times in your work. This seems to be one of the key um, components of your work is developing intuition. Would you yeah, say my that mission, true? Yeah, my mission is actually to help people to get closer to their intuition and to really follow, not just understand their intuition, but follow it, take action on their intuition. Because for me, intuition, you know, we pray to God for help, uh, and God answers us through our intuition. Mm -hmm. So my, my definition of intuition is God talking back to us. And God wants us to have a great life. So, okay, just follow your intuition. You'll always be good. And, I mean, everybody knows when they don't listen to their gut instinct, they don't listen to the intuition, they always go, ah, I wish I followed my intuition because they always mess up. And it's just, it's just life. God wants us to have a great life. So just follow that intuition and everything will be great. And when you don't follow your intuition, it's you, you know it pretty fast. So everyone has had that experience. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So intuition for me is, it, my mission, as I was saying, is really help people to, to connect with their intuition, to follow their intuition, and then we'll take the actual intuition so their life flows forward. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I mean, last night I, I, I started a men's workshop, men's group, that uh, is training men to follow their intuition, follow their gut instinct, so that they can become better leaders in, in the world, whether it's in their family, their community, or some of the clients I work with are very big, uh, highly influential people, and how they can become a better leader by following their intuition instead of just following their mind or their ego. And uh, it's great. I'm looking forward to presenting it again in the fall, uh, the workshop. So it's pretty exciting. That's cool. I'm sure that that, you know, was born from your sense of intuition of, of knowing that that was the next step in your journey. I imagine it takes a lot of humility to be guided. I mean, I, I, I also feel guided by my intuition in many ways, probably not as in touch as you are, but uh, I imagine it takes a level of humility to be able to say, I'm taking this next step. I don't exactly know where all this is going and what I'm doing here, but I'm here to serve. This is obviously where God has put me. What do you do when that voice in your head is telling you like, uh, this is definitely your next step, but you don't really know what you're getting into here. I have much bigger plans for you than you could imagine. What, what do you do when you step into that kind of unknown space? Well, it's the whole thing about um, coming from your head down to your heart. Mm -hmm. is, is really key because the mind has only got all the, it's like a computer. It has all the information you've observed through life, your life experiences and so forth. So it's limited. The, the, the hard drive is limited with the knowledge, right? Whereas you come down into your heart, it's like accessing the internet. You can access more information across the whole, the whole spiritual globe, so to speak. And, and, mm -hmm. and then of course, uh, accessing God's knowledge. So the amount, of, the amount of times when I've got an intuition and then my mind kicks in to discount it and I go, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And I learned very early in my career that I wanted to follow my intuition because I saw so many great results for my clients. And so I actually made some, I, I was praying, God, please teach me to follow my intuition. And God gave me two examples that really, my mind couldn't create. And that's the key is like, is this just my mind or is this my ego? Or is this my intuition? What is it? And so when I was learning to, to listen to my intuition, um, the two examples, the first one that happened was a lady came, a client came who was in her 50s. And I opened the door and I saw her and my intuition said, go and buy her flowers. I'm like, what? My mind's like, I don't know this lady. Why do I, so I said, okay, I made a commitment. I'm going to follow what God says. So I said, okay, let's, we have to go down to the store and pick up something for your session. So we drove down the store and I got the flowers and then I gave them to her and I said, here, these are for you. And immediately she just started bursting out and crying. I was like, I was like, holy shit, what have I done? You know? And what had happened was no one had ever given her flowers in her whole life. Wow. So that was the whole healing then there's no way my mind, my conscious mind would know to do that or have any access. So that was my first lesson of, of trusting God knows what to do. I just got to follow. I just got to be the instrument. I, I'm the trumpet and God's going to blow through me and make a sound. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? 
So that was it. And the second example was this lady came, who was a friend of mine, came for a session. And as soon as I opened the door, my intuition said she has to do a cartwheel, you know, where you do the cartwheel and the with your whole body and you spin over. I'm like, okay. So I said, oh, you need to go and do a cartwheel. And she's like, well, I trust you, Kim, so I'll try it out. So she did it. And as soon as she did the cartwheel, everything that she had bought to that to clear in the session was gone. So that was, again, there's no way my mind could ever think to tell somebody to do a cartwheel. Wow. So that was like showing me your conscious mind will make up stories, but what is your intuition? How is your intuition telling you? And since then, I've got ways where I'm praying to God when I'm working with a client and I'm asking and I'll get shown what to do and I'll just follow it. And then instantly the person feels lighter or their mind is clear or their stress goes from their body or the whatever issue they're working with is just gone. And I go, pretty cool. So that's, that's what I do. So Man. learning to follow you, it's everyone has intuition. But how covered up is it? How covered up is all the stress of life or how much conditioning we've had through our, through our life experience, our education, our upbringing? And can we peel away all those, that, those, that density of our life experience so that we can really sink into our heart, into our soul, and really listen to that inner voice, that, that knowing? And when you have that connection with the with your intuition, nobody can tell you otherwise. Even your own ego cannot tell you otherwise because you know it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing is practice, 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 listening to your intuition. And then when you, and sometimes when you have an intuition, you say, okay, I'm going to go against my intuition just to see what happens. So you're just acknowledging intuition is a win. And you go against it, say you turn left instead of turning right. And you go, oh, that was a that was crazy idea. Now I know why I should have gone right. Mm -hmm. So it's like practicing. And then when you, okay, now I'm going to follow my intuition, even though my logic says it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I turn right. It seems like a longer way, but then you find out later there was a car accident. It would have been an extra hour waiting, right? The other way. So it's like learning to, to trust that inner guidance, that inner knowing. But how do you get there if your mind's going a thousand miles an hour, right? So that you've was, got to calm your mind down. That was where I wanted to go next. Is like, I, I think this is easier said than done. You make it sound very simple. Um, but it was a lot of years of, of practice, <laughs> let me tell you. All right. Yeah. And I work a lot with the clients, clearing all their stress so that they can come down and really feel that and connect with that intuition. That's a lot of the work I do is helping people to really connect with their intuition. And, you know, just for your listeners at home, just putting your hands on your heart and feeling your heart. And just when you can feel, and if you can't feel your heart, just feel your hands on your chest. Just have that connection with below the neck, okay? That's a lot of my teaching is about above versus below the neck. And when you feel your hands on your chest, speak from here and say, I forgive myself. And then you see what happens in your body. Is your mind a little different? Is it busier? Is it quieter? Is your chest more relaxed or is it more tense? You know, you're just like testing it, seeing where it is. And then the next thing you'd say is, I love myself. And all this is doing is, is working to open your heart so that you have a better connection with your intuition. But you can't do it from here. If you just say, I forgive myself and I love myself, they're just words. There's no power. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to come below the neck and really, I love myself and feel how it's just subtle. Like you're really training yourself to feel the subtle changes. And that's, that's a great way to condition yourself to start listening to your intuition. So were you, were you born with a family that kind of taught you these types of things or when did you kind of make this your own? Um, no, I was raised Catholic and, but my parents were never, we go to the, the major holidays to church, but 
when I was a teenager, something happened to me and I just felt I should go on my own. So I just went to church on my own and jump on my bike and ride to church every Sunday. And I didn't know why I was there. And so I just kept going. And then eventually when I got into my late teens, I got into partying and you know, having a good time in college and so forth. So that went way out of, my, out of my life. And then when I started doing the work, I started going back and I started listening. And what I would do is I would be driving along the road and it's almost like my car would pull into a church parking lot. And so I just go in. I was like, okay, why am I here? And I'd just go inside, follow my intuition. And I would go inside, there's no one in the church, go inside the church and sit down. What I learned was if I sat there for five minutes, I would see how I felt after five minutes. And if I felt better, I would come back again to that place, to that church. Because there, there was a presence, a spiritual presence there, or a blessing other, other churches, I couldn't even enter the door. It was like, no, I'm not going in there. It's like everything was like crunching up inside. And so I just left. I never went back there. So that is, again, learning to follow your intuition. Just because it's a house of worship doesn't necessarily mean it's a clean house of worship. Mm -hmm. So it's listening to your intuition. And, and, and I've done a lot of cleaning on the churches to help them to bring more of that love and that that blessing into the into the space and i've been to temp when i was living in asia going to temples and going to synagogues i've gone to different denominational churches it's the same thing how does your intuition feel do you feel the heart opening or do you feel the heart closing it's not a mental thing and so it's like the more you practice this you're entering a church just to spend five minutes with God and see how you feel after that five minutes. And if you feel great, go back there again. It's a good place. And if mm -hmm. you feel your mind is faster or you feel a bit stressed, well, it's probably not a clean church or a clean place. And, it, and as I said, sometimes I, w I was like, no, everything was like, don't go in there. It's like, okay, I won't go in there. Now, no, I think one no, thing, one thing that a lot of... I think one thing that a lot of like mission driven people, missionaries, um, people that go into places that have a lot of trauma and, and hold this kind of energy. I, I imagine you do this as well. What do you do to like armor yourself when you, you know, lots of times to be purposeful is to enter these places. Like Jesus would go to places that, and, and people that were being neglected and we're not, you know, seen as holy and pure and wonderful so you have to go to those places to be a people of purpose. I think it feels that way. What do you do to kind of armor yourself and prepare yourself to enter spaces like so that? First of all, I listen to my intuition. So I don't go to a place that doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. With my work, which is about clearing the spaces, I'm. it takes me a couple of hours to prepare myself to be ready to walk into that space. But I'm going in there on a mission. My purpose is to clear all the negativity out of the space, all the stress, uh, all the disharmony. Uh, if there's any problems with the, the magnetic grid flow within the property to correct all that. And so I'm called in to work to go and clear the spaces. So that's a different story. So I'm pre prepared before I enter. I'm not entering. Uh, my intuition, when I listen to it, I don't go to places that are not clean. So it's like or not, not, not clean enough for, for mm -hmm. me to go like a restaurant or whatever, a bar. Uh, so, so then I go in and I'm prepared. Now, this is a great example. I had this client call me because they were having marital problems in their new home. And they couldn't understand because they had such a beautiful, loving relationship before they moved to the new home. So I went there. And as soon as I entered the house, my intuition said they're sleeping in separate rooms. And so I asked them, are you sleeping in separate rooms? And they said, no, we're sleeping together. And so I said, why is this? So the house was actually, the energy was separated. So we cleaned the house. And I said, why did you call me in? And they said, because when we're not home, we're harmonious. But when we're at home, we're always fighting. Wow. And so they knew it was the space that wasn't them. They had enough understanding of their love, their relationship together that it wasn't them because they'd be out of the restaurant, and they'd be happy. And then they'd come home and they'd start fighting. So anyway, so we did the clearing 
and got rid of the problem. Then we found out there was five separations in the house. And the first one was a really bad divorce. And so every person, every couple that moved into the house after them always separated. Mm. And it was the energy that was left over from the first, from the first people. So that's, that's a beautiful home. Our house is a beautiful home to look at and, and a great area, everything. But the energy in the house was causing separation. And that's why they were fighting because they knew how much their love together was so strong and yet they were fighting at each other. It was crazy. So, so it's some sort of karma thing that's going on. That, that space is holding the effects of the past and it's going to impact the present people that are in that area. Is that, is exactly. that right? It's just like, you know, dust collects in a corner. It just builds up over time and keeps building and like attracts likes and more of the negative keeps attracting. And then anyone who enters the space can be can be affected by it when did you know that that, (laughs) speaking about relationships there was one i did in europe and they called me in it was a uh, like a city hall type building and there was one room where they were um they were the marriage like a marriage counseling or marriage place and i walked in there and it was an old uh gestapo i saw the images of the swash sticker on the wall energetically from from the time of world war ii and so that was a headquarters for the for the gestapo and the energy was so thick you could cut it with a knife so anyone who went in there as a couple were like this this agitation they couldn't deal with it because of the past energy and as soon as you removed it there was no no problems anymore what do you need to do to remove this kind of energy it comes with generations of you know of being there how do you just you just knock it down like you knock a wall down or what do you do uh yeah uh i do all different i obviously i'm praying to god and asking god how may i correct the situation bring love into the situation and then i'm guided i have many different modalities i reach for a lot of the um training i've had most of my work comes through my my spiritual mentor victor baron out in los angeles he taught me a lot of shamanistic type natural ways of clearing energy spaces and the rest is, you know, of course, God is my boss and Christ is my boss. So I just ask them and they show me what to do. And then I just follow the guidance and then remove the energy and then bring peace and harmony into the space. And then, of course, the blessing. Blessing is so important. People don't realize um, how important a blessing is when, from the heart. Uh, like blessing your food or blessing your home. It's so important. Like I went to this one house in Dallas and there were two crosses on the wall. And I said to the lady, why is this one blessed and this one's not? And she goes, how did you know that? I said, well, because I can feel the blessing coming off the cross. And she said, well, this was blessed by the priest when we got married. And this one we bought at a local store because we liked the design. But it had no blessing. It was just the shape. Wow. So, so it's like the blessing is so important for a space, for, you know, blessing your food, you know, when people say grace over their food, you're asking for a blessing to help bring that peace and harmony into your world, into your life. So. Yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. Tell me more about like, so I'm a Christian as well. I want to, I want to kind of understand your take on, on who Christ is and the role that Christ plays in all this work that you do. Uh, Christ is the son of God and, you know, he's my boss. I pray to him every day. I I spend two hours a day praying to improve my abilities, improve my uh, intuition, to improve my capacity to, and my capabilities to help more people. Uh, And God is everything. God, the Mm -hmm. father, son, Holy spirit. And that's it. And I pray to the Virgin Mary um do the rosary a lot every day to just build the strength the spiritual strength to be able to serve to be a better instrument is your prayer mostly you talking outward or is a lot of it just receiving and listening depending what i'm praying for uh it's both uh so i'll pray for a specific so i'll do a a prayer for humanity say and i'll be praying and I will get met 
intuitional messages of what's going on or what where the stress is and i'll just keep blessing and forgiving and giving say god just use me to help humanity uh and then i'll pray for myself and i'll feel a different uh i'll get information about myself from from helping my own life mm -hmm. and i'll pray to my guardian angel to to have a closer relationship with my guardian angel and when he comes my angel comes close to me i can feel the like it's like getting rid of my own stuff and my own crap, which is beautiful. And then I'll pray. Uh, so I'm, I'm praying. I have an intent when I'm praying. And then I'll get the intuition or I'll notice my thoughts go in a certain direction. And before I used to think it was just my mind was too busy. But now I understand it's actually because of my intent. I'm getting the information I need because of the intent. And then I say, oh, okay, now this person needs help. So I'll send a blessing for that person. Uh, and, or I'll get, oh, we need to help this community or whatever. And, and I'll just, just focus on that. So it's like both. It's, it's giving out the prayer. I offer the mm -hmm. prayer to God and then I receive whatever I need mm -hmm. to help. So does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. So, and you also have an app that's kind of like way shorter than two hours. It's like two minutes to focus. What, what's going on with that app and how does that Okay, so for 20 that? years, I was like struggling to quiet my mind. And when I was in college, you know, I was studying, of course, you know, you get, your mind goes busy before exams and being sensitive, I would pick up on everyone else's stress in the, in the uh, exam room. Yeah, that's so right. So I'd start to learn how can I be, almost like immune to everyone else's stress. So I can just be focused and my mind can be clear to answer the questions. And once I, and I, so there's three in the app, there's three parts. And the first two parts I learned when I was in college and I put them together or actually before and after college and I put them together. I noticed that my grades started to go up mm -hmm. because I wasn't being stressed by um, everyone else's stress. Okay. So and this also comes back to intuition because when you listen to your intuition, you get good with your intuition, you can actually feel what other people, what's going on for other people. And this is just to sidetrack a little bit. When you get that and you feel uncomfortable and you know you were fine five minutes ago, you know it's not you. So you thank your intuition. Thank you, my intuition, for showing me. And by thanking your intuition, it leaves you the stress because it wasn't yours. If you thank your intuition, the stress is still there, it's yours, okay? So this app, um, so I was working, for, I said, I've got, there's got to be a way to, to quiet the mind. It's got to be better. I kept working and actually the third part, which was the breakthrough I got from a brain scientist, how we can change our blood chemistry uh, through breathing and so forth. So I put it all together in this nice package and when I tried it out, it only took two minutes. And I noticed that after two minutes, my mind was quieter. I go, this is pretty cool. So I realized it was like a two-minute meditation. Mm -hmm. And so I teach people how, to, how they can meditate in two minutes or people who wanted to pray or people who wanted to meditate or people who wanted to get ready for an interview or people want to get ready for an exam. They would do this mm -hmm. two-minute meditation or two minutes to, to focus their mind so they could be clear on what their mission was for that, whatever that event they're doing, whether it's an exam or an interview or, or just praying. So it's, a, so it's a real fast, if someone's doing a 20 minute meditation, quite often their mind is going crazy. So if you do the two minutes first, it's like quietens you down so you can get better results out of your meditation. So it's like praying. a pre, it's like an appetizer to the meditation or prayer. Yes. And some people say, hey, I feel so good after that, I'll do it again. So they do four minutes. They just repeat it. And that's their whole meditation. They don't have to do 20 minutes anymore. They just did it in four minutes. And some people go six minutes. So it's like, but it's about changing your, your mind, changing, uh, eliminating the connections you have with other people in that moment, changing your blood chemistry so that you can come down to center and then connect with focus or meditate. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what the app's all about. Very cool. Yeah. It sounds like you've gone through a lot of evolutions in your career path. 
Um, you're clearing wow. spaces, you're developing apps, you're coaching people. I don't know exactly what my question is, but like, what is like some core, core principles of how you turn these like awesome skill sets that, that obviously elevate your experience of life into businesses each time? Like what, what do you do to make that happen to bring money in from, you know, learning how to focus your mind or whatever? Um, or learning how to clear spaces. How are you, what, what principles do you bring into um, how to turn these into business businesses of their own? Okay, so first one was, I talked about, about asking how may I serve? Mm -hmm. Asking the question, how may I serve? And then who may I serve is another question, right? Because you've got to find out who can you serve. The thing is with the business side, the money side, is that because we live in a physical world, we need to have an exchange of energy. So there has to be some sort of exchange of energy. And I learned, it, it, like I said, trial and error. I learned the hard way. I made mistakes. I tried different pricing strategies. Uh, some worked, some worked, didn't work. I remember when I started, uh, I was charging, this is about 30 years, I was charging like 100 bucks an hour. And then I was like so busy. I was like, okay, we'll just keep going. I didn't think about it. And someone said, you know, you charge like three times more than everyone else in your industry. I go, really? I had no idea. I had no idea what the competition was doing. And uh, I said, well, I better drop my prices then, right? So I dropped my prices and people didn't get the results. I was like, what? Well, I'm helping more people because they can afford it. But what I found was there, was a, there wasn't the exchange wasn't flowing. So it has to be an equal exchange of energy for it to be, to manifest, the, the result so then i learned and i started i said i dropped a certain price and then i noticed that people would have to come for five sessions to get the same result i'm like this is not what i want i want results you know so i put the price up a few dollars and like got they got it in one session i'm like okay there is something about this money exchange mm -hmm. and then sometimes i charge too much it came back and hurt me so I had to learn where's the, and this is the, again, the point of intuition, where's the point of exchange that makes it harmonious? Mm -hmm. And you've got to listen to your intuition. I have to say that from personal experience, uh, because when I've helped someone, when my intuition said, no, don't do it, I've always got hurt. So the exchange of any energy was pain for me. And you should feel completely free and happy and joyful after you've helped somebody. Of course, you'll be physically tired if you've been working, but there's a sense of, you know, a really good feeling inside. That's when you know you're in harmony with your exchange. Hmm. So then I also wrote a book. I think you talked about the uh, winning, uh, is your money running on empty? And that's, an, that's my life experience of how I was able to build up the consciousness, because I was I grew up in a consciousness where if you're working for God, you don't get paid, right? You do it for free. But every time I did yeah. that, I got hurt. So I had to, like, okay, well, if I'm doing a service, I've got to get an exchange of energy. So I wrote about how to change your unconscious belief structure so that you can be give, give even more because you can't give. It's like... Um, the, uh, the way the book came out about was because of the, uh, when I used to fly, the, the instruction on the, from the air stewardess was put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help others. Mm. And I was doing the other ones. I was giving to others before I gave to myself. So I had to learn this and went through the process of learning how to change the unconscious so that you can be giving all the time from, a, from abundance. You can't be giving from scarcity. You can't be giving from emptiness. You have to be overflowing. And that's why I do all this praying so my energy can be coming out so I can give more to people. Mm. I mean, that's a long-winded answer, but hopefully that, that helps you a bit. Yeah, I, I think on, on the surface, there seems to be some sort of contradiction that you're, you're living a life fully dedicated to service, but you're like, there's an aspect of this where you need to receive in order to be able to give that service. Can you break down kind of what that, that small like little mindset shift is? If someone is in, in if it's say a client is in integrity with their, their heart, mm -hmm. say I was living in the desert 
and a client came to me for healing. They're going to be give me a bag of oranges or a or a chicken or something, you know. That's mm -hmm. because of their respect for the exchange they've received. So there is an exchange of energy by providing food for me. Even Christ said, you know, don't take any money, just receive what they feed you. So it's like there has to be the exchange so you can keep working. If you're empty, you can't help anybody. Mm -hmm. If you're stressed about paying the bills, you can't help. If I want to uh, fly to America to help someone, it's like, well, I still have to pay for the air ticket. Now, where that, where's that money coming from? So it has to be, it has to, because we live in a material world, you have to have that. And we use money as an exchange in, in our, in humanity right now. Right. Just like I said, if I was in the desert, they bring me food. So it's like you just did, but that's honoring the exchange. People who take that, they, they, well, I've had five situations where people didn't pay and all five or well, four of them were bankrupt. And one of them lost his business afterwards because they didn't honor the exchange. There has to be a flow. So back to like, I guess my question is when you're setting up a business around um, clearing spaces or getting two minutes to focus or whatever type of business that you do, what is that process to make sure that you're getting enough in to pay the bills before you start to scale up that business and say, I'm ready to serve 15 people. I'm ready to commit, you know, 20 hours a week to this. How do you, it seems like there's an aspect of business where you have to like take a risk and go out on a limb and, you know, give before that you can receive the, the thing in, in return. How does that process work for you in the early stages? Well, definitely um, when you're learning a new skill, I, I always believe give to five people, no charge, and let them then see who refers people to you. Mm -hmm. So that you, so you're giving to see, am I giving something that is of value to others? Mm -hmm. And and if they give you a referral or they give you a testimonial or whatever, they they're really grateful. They come back for more, but they want to pay you. But the, the thing is, remember I was saying about the mind is like a computer. You have, I mean, your mind is brilliant for working out all your accounting and all your chemistry and everything like that. It's, it's the heart that does all the big life decisions, but you've got to live in the material. It's no good giving if you're empty. Mm -hmm. You can't give if you're on your deathbed because you haven't eaten for a week. So to find the price you charge, this is again where you come back to the intuition. And, and also, you could use your brain, okay, what's the market charging? Does that feel good? And I talk about that in the book, um, Is Your Money Running on Empty? How, how does my heart feel? How does my mind calculate the price? And how does my, my heart feel? And does it feel integrity? Or does it feel like I'm stressed? Or is it uh, too greedy? Or, and you're trying to find where's that exchange? Mm -hmm. And then you calculate, use your brain again to calculate, okay, here's my living expenses. How much do I need to, at this price, how many clients do I need to have to make it work? And allocating funds for marketing or, or exposure, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. In those, in the early days, I would go to every breakfast club uh, meeting I could get to, networking meeting, just to, to speak for five minutes, 10 minutes to tell people what I did. And then through the praying, the people would come. Mm -hmm. So it's really getting the exposure um, to start your business. When the referrals are coming, you know it's like, okay, I'm providing a service. That's mm -hmm. that's uh, in integrity. Cool. Does that help your question? Yeah, that definitely helps. That's really important to, to remember that, people will, will refer people when, when you're providing a real value and service and it, cause they want to repay you in some way and they want to, you know, help yes. your business grow. Makes yes. sense. So you don't and, really ask for those first five people to pay. You don't ask them to do certain X, Y, and Z. You just give to them and then you see what comes back to you. Yeah. And just, um, and it's honoring and respecting yourself. You know, my, my teacher would always say, make sure you have a, a side job when you're starting out your business so you've got food on the table, right? 
Right. You can't you can't work if you're if you're hungry. So it's like you have a side business that's just taking care of the basics while you're building your business. Mm -hmm. That's I, I think what we're talking about here is more uh, common sense, which is not very common these days. But anyway, that's another story. It's like what what taking care of business, especially you know if you have children or whatever, you know you've got to provide or you have a partner, it's like you've got to feed yourself, you've got to feed your family. So you've got to do whatever it takes to um, to provide the basics as you're building your business. Right. Okay. And then on top of that, I, I've noticed that as a, as a startup type of person, you end up kind of burning the candle at both ends as well. I'm sure you've kind of been tempted with those things. Uh, oh, yeah. I really, I really admire how you keep such a calm disposition when I'm sure that you're really busy and you have a lot of people working for you and you have a lot of problems coming your way. Um, I'm sure you have great systems of handling those things, but what do you do when you're in a season of, of like needing to, to pay the bills and work the full-time job and then have the, the side business that's getting started and all the extra work that comes with starting a business and you still want to be there for your partner. You still want to be there for your health and you still want to have those two hour prayer sessions. How do you do it all? I would do, um, I would set very strong boundaries on how many hours you can devote to your business mm -hmm. and only do not cross those boundaries. So you say it's five hours a week or 20 hours a month that you're devoting to your business. And you just have such tight boundaries around that time that you don't bleed. As soon as you bleed, you start to burn yourself out. As soon as you go, oh, a couple more, I need to get this done. No, stay in those boundaries. Then what happens is it's like the law of, uh, what is it? Um, uh, supply and demand. When your supply is tight, the demand gets stronger. So mm -hmm. you become more attractive. When you're burning yourself out, you, you become less attractive. When you extend your time that you're focusing on your business, you become less attractive. Mm -hmm. So people don't come. And then you think you have to work harder, right, to get to get more business. And it's not the way. It's like you got to be really clear on what's my commitment. What do I decide to do? How many hours a month am I going to do to my business, devote to my business and stick to it? And this will build power within yourself. It's that commitment to yourself and that way you protect yourself from burning out. Now, what do you do if you have ideas that feel like they're coming from your intuition? You just shelve them for the next day because you can't take action right now because you've already hit your budget? Your intuition would not um, interfere with it. And if you get a great idea, write it down. Have, a, have an ideas journal. Just write it down. I have a, what I call the not now list. So I just put it on my not now list. And then every so often I look through my not now list. Oh, that's time to come out. Mm -hmm. So God will never give you more than you can handle. So quite often when you're in that phase, it's not God. It's actually just your ego or your mind or you're excited. Yeah. And so you just, and I had to learn when I got those great ideas to sit on it for 36. For me, it was 36 hours where I couldn't take an uh, action on it for 36 hours. And until and after 36 hours, half of them were not real. And yeah. so I was like, okay. And took it, it was trial and error to find, first I tried 24 hours, then I tried 12 hours, and 18 hours. I just kept playing until I found 36 was my my ideal number where I got really clear. This is, this is a go or it's no go. That's super cool. And then I have this, this list of not the not now list. And every you know, once a month or so, I'll look at the list and it'll just pop out because your interest will say it's time to work on that. And that's when you do it. But if you've got a thousand ideas, uh, you, you, you'll never have enough time for them all. Right. So, uh, and then the more you respect your time, the more you have those boundaries, the more... God will give to you because you're being uh, honoring yourself, respecting yourself, and obviously your family. And it, it, you're building credibility in your, in your energy field and respecting yourself. And other people also feel that. 
cool. So you're not sleeping less. You're not spending less time with your family. You're putting the boundary on the business. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was I always like that? No way. When I started out, I was like, crazy, <laughs> man. 80 hours a week, no problem. I just was so passionate about it. But then nobody yeah. came. Right? I was like, where are the clients? I'm, where, I'm so excited about my business and investing and marketing and everything. And it was like, nobody came because I was too much. What made them so start I, coming? When I realized this, is, this was a lesson, they started coming when my heart opened. But when you're, over, you're overworked and stressed, your heart's closed for survival because uh -huh. you're not listening to your heart. When your heart opens, and then you can start to attract. Mm. God's not going to send you someone if you're burnt out. And our ego will say, well, I have to work harder. You have to work harder to get, get more. No, it's not true. Work less, receive more. So it's trial and error, finding out what is your optimal work time. Like for years, I remember when I used to work five, once I almost burnt out and, and unfortunately some friends of mine burnt out and it, for 10 years, 20 years, they couldn't work anymore. It's like they fried their electrical system in their body. So I came close to that back in 2002, I thought 2001, 2002. And it scared the crap out of me because I was like, what's wrong with me? I had to take six weeks off just to recover. And because I was so excited, I had so much work. I was like, wow, this is a great, I just kept working. I didn't respect boundaries. So I never wanted that to happen again. So I started to experiment. How many days in a month can I work? How many days in a week can I work? How many hours in a day can I work? How much recovery do I need? So it was like this, this constant adjustment till I found out what my ideal formula is. And everyone is different. So you find out what your formula is. How many hours can I spend a week? How many hours can I spend a month? And that's it. And then you stick to it. Again, you're setting the boundaries because you want, the more you're tied on those boundaries, the more income you will go up, will go up because you're not burnt out. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's great sharing. Wow. So you're tied into this awesome network with Dan Sullivan. Uh, I would love to like be able to be close to Dan one day. I, I just know about him. I'm reading his book, Who Not How, right now. Written uh, by, right. Yeah. It's written by Benjamin Hardy, who was a uh -huh. previous guest of my show. Uh, that's how I found out about you. Was through yeah, ben. that's who connected us. Yep. Ben it's was like, like really cool. People of Purpose podcast. So, yeah. That's awesome. So yeah. uh, when you have a goal, and this is something that um, I'm trying to teach people as well, the difference between goal and potential. And my experience is that when you go for goals, you can, you can burn yourself out. You can hurt yourself. But if you go for your potential, you'll never get tired. Mm-hmm. Like when I was in my running, when I was doing my running, every week I would improve because I was working on my potential. Mm -hmm. Wonder how far I could get, how far, how much faster I could I run? Then I switched to my goal of winning the Olympics, and I started having problems, and I started getting injuries, and I think it's getting sick, and there was all these other problems happening, and and so uh, when I was shifted to my career now, I started to see the same thing, and then I realized, ah, don't. Don't just go for your potential. So you're constantly improving every day, you're getting better and better rather than trying to go for a huge height uh, without preparation, without the capability or the teamwork around you to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different logic than most people preach. Most people are like, break your big things into small goals and move your way towards them. You don't think that there's a lot to that's that? That's great. No, no, that's great. As long as you acknowledge the journey, the chunking it down. If you can see, well, I got to this point and it took me this much time. I thought it was going to do it in this short time, but it took me longer. So I'm going to adjust my goals, my long-term yeah. goal to fit. I'm not going to put myself under more pressure because I've got this deadline right. out in the future, which is not real. So you're starting to acknowledge, uh, I always say aim forward and measure back. So you're aiming towards the goal or, the, or wherever it is. 
but you, when you're chunking down your goals, you're adjusting the goal depending on your number of hours, you know, your boundaries of your hours and how you're, how you're building your capacity to achieve that goal. Because mm -hmm. otherwise our, our minds think, hey, I can get it right now, you know? And it's not real. It's mental. I, I've noticed that too. I've been an entrepreneur for one and a half years now and it feels like you always overestimate what you can do in a short period of time. But if you stay consistent and work towards it, then you look back and you're like, wow, I didn't know that like, I could accomplish that much. It's like looking back is a ton of gratitude, but you know, seeing in the, in the last, you know, three months, I did not hit this goal, but I have an immense amount of gratitude for what I did figure out. It's usually growth things that I feel really happy or proud about. It's not a certain metric that I had out, you know, planned out for me. Usually exactly. God, God kind of takes things in a, in a slightly different direction than I anticipated. And I grew or I found a new relationship or I had a meaningful, like, switch in my mindset or I, I met a new connection that you know put me on a new path of opportunity these kinds of serendipitous things that come up in the process of pursuing goals they're really fascinating to me um how do you think about like you know being clear and directed to your goal but like having new things come into your your field of awareness that maybe kind of can be I, positive distractions from the goal like what, what do you think about that Definitely. Well, like when I was uh, with the book, uh, Is Your Money Running on Empty? When I, was, when I set that program up for myself, I thought I was going for to be wealthy, to get rich, okay? Because then all the stress would go away out of my business, all the costs of running my business would disappear. And so I was working towards the goal. And on the journey, I found out actually there's a bigger purpose here. Mm -hmm. And the bigger reason was... I'm actually, it's not about getting rich. It's about becoming wealthy. And the wealth was, was peace of mind, relaxed in the body. I was seeing as I was doing the process, my whole body and persona was calming down. Mm -hmm. So by doing this program with the money, I actually had a, a side benefit where I felt more relaxed, more mm -hmm. peace. I was like, this is what you're actually going for, not for the money. It was so cool. So it was like that was a side. I did, wasn't expecting that at all. But it actually came as a side benefit of it. And so I changed my, I used the program going for the financial goals. But the real goal was this potential of being at peace and being calm and being able to be of service. And be, there was all these side benefits. It wasn't about that. It's like like now I've got this new mission where I'm getting in shape to uh, to to have another crack at the world champs for my age uh, running, and it's like if I don't make it, it doesn't matter because I'm going to get health, wellness, I'm going to get fitness, flexibility. It's going to be so many benefits I'm going to get out mm -hmm. of it. It's got nothing to do with the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So that whole thing about potential, how can I do every every time I'm exercising? How can this help my life? not mm -hmm. just win this, this gold medal. Mm -hmm. So it's very cool. Very cool. Well, I guess I wanted to, to give you an opportunity to share about what you're doing right now and how people can get plugged in. I know that I, I give you, I gave you like a little sheet. I give all guests a little sheet um, to help us prepare. I, I noticed that you um, said that people could book a group transformation session with you. Mm -hmm. What, what is the purpose of those? What kind of happens at those? And, you know, what would someone expect if they were to book one of those? So what, uh, if someone comes to one of the group transformation sessions, they're, it's giving them a taste of my work. They're receiving a healing. They're, uh, I have two types. One is called um, remove stress, achieve success. And basically what I'm doing is I'm removing all the stress you have in the moment and clearing your energy so that when you're at, after the, the, the clearing, which is only like 20 minutes long, you feel completely quiet in your mind. You feel relaxed in your body and you're more in touch with your heart, more in touch with your intuition so that you can go forward. Mm -hmm. So it's like a cleanup, once a month cleanup. And then the other GTA, uh, group, group transformation session, I have a specific focus 
And I wrote a book called Winning the Game of Life, which you can get on Amazon. And this is eight mindsets of the most successful clients I've had and how they operate. And so what I've done is I've broken down these group transformation sessions to focus on one specific mindset to clear that energy out of their or that blockage so they can grow to a new level within that mindset so they can improve and that one usually is about 45 minutes to an hour long and that's uh, i have various different topics each month helping people to grow in in whatever area they want to improve so that's the two that i offer and then some people say hey i'd like to do more personal one-on-one -on -one with you or can I get my whole team together? Like I've got, I've been working for companies where I'll do, they'll have their annual meeting and I'll give them a 20 minute clearing at the beginning of the annual meeting. So everyone is like clear so they can go forward. And so I do group transformation sessions for companies as well. And I call it the uh, team transformation 20 because it's only 20 minutes. And so it all clears. And so people ask me, why do you do it so fast? What's the deal? And the reason was when I very first started my business i had a client this is in los angeles and i did the session spent about an hour with her and afterwards she said to me do you know i just spent 10 years in therapy on this problem and you got rid of it in one hour and i'm like i was so naive I was like, why would anyone spend 10 years in therapy this is crazy what a waste you know because i'm <laughs> such a i want to i want to win i want my clients to win so i said that's it i made a commitment that if I can do help this lady in one hour, what took her 10 years, I want to grow to be able to do it in 10 minutes to wipe it out of their life, the, the issue. So, so that's, that was, that's how it all was born. That was 27 years ago. So I've been working on that goal to how can I improve? How can I improve my strength so that I can get people a result faster? And now I get people in a group a result faster. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the next level. So, cool. What do you think it is that makes you such a special coach out of all the hundreds of coaches out there that people could work with? What is it about you and your work that, that you think um, really impacts or resonates with people? My passion for getting results and improving human performance. Um, my relentless pursuit of excellence or my relentless pursuit of my persistence to get a result. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of time I take to prepare to help people, my commitment to God to be the best instrument I can be for God. Uh, and I want, I want my people to win. You know, I want people to, to have a great life. Mm -hmm. So this is really what, what would differentiate me um i haven't come across because i mix spirituality with business and sport i haven't really come across anyone who does that also so that makes me unique mm -hmm. and but definitely getting results fast as possible so that people have a great life i want people to get clear of whatever's holding them back so they can move forward and enjoy life Beautiful. Well said. Well said. I have no doubt. You just, I mean, you did a lot of transformation in me within this session. Um, you know, seeing how to apply some of these things you just talked about. I, I know I'm going to walk away a changed person just from this interview. And I'm sure that that's true for about anyone that, that happens to listen to this. It's been a really big blessing to have you and your experience and your, you know, you're an instrument of God. And it's really wonderful to be in that presence for for an hour and get to kind of ask all these sort of meandering questions that come to my mind um i have such a clear picture of of who you are and what you do and i, I know that you can really be a great service to the world um Thank i'm you. definitely going to recommend people to to go to those sessions and i'll probably come to one myself too wonderful thank you very much mm -hmm. Well, I usually like to, to ask um, at the end of the interview about kind of legacy stuff. Um, do you have a big, you know, vision for, for what, what this looks like in 100 years, um, the kind of impact that you're looking to leave on the earth? Or is that not really necessarily how you think of things? What do you think uh, of when you think of the legacy of your work? 
Definitely. Uh, I, I've just, uh, next year I start my next 25 year plan. So I've been preparing for that to prepare all the literature, the training to make it available for the future. So if something happens to me that it keeps going without me, uh, mm -hmm. that people can receive and learn and grow. Uh, I'm constantly on the lookout for other practitioners who have gifts that I don't have that I can, I can collaborate with to help my clients um, to get the results. So I guess that's probably the legacy is like not just finished, you know, living my life, but actually giving to the future mm -hmm. in whatever way I can and just working my butt off to get the best, best results and simplest for people to get the simplest results. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I want. That's my legacy there. Beautiful. Legacy plan. Beautiful. Especially well, that's... About in the beginning about the men's group, you know, uh, mm -hmm. helping the men to be better leaders, to be, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the overview of it. It's about in, in the old teachings or the teachings in the churches is about man being a, uh, obedient to God. And, mm -hmm. the re and most men are because they're obedient to their ego. And so helping them to come in contact with their intuition is them being obedient to God. When they're following their intuition, they're following God. Mm -hmm. And so helping men to really build up their power and their strength uh, through the healings and through the discussions we do in the trainings so that they can walk into the world with this energy of leadership to really help the world rather than be just a part of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big, um, big focus of mine going forward is helping men. So. Beautiful. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all this. It's You're welcome. Really Thank you for the invite. I really appreciate uh, spending the time with you. It's yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Is there anything else you'd like to, to say before we, we cut the recording? No, I, I just, if people want to get in contact with me, they can go to uh, uh, kimwhitecoaching.com okay. and they can, uh, there's a there's a free, um, one of the techniques called the cutting off technique, which will help you to disconnect from people who are draining your energy so you can mm -hmm. come back more to yourself so you feel more uh, of who you are, which gives you cl cl greater clarity towards your intuition. So you can download that there on the website. And also you can find out where my next group transformation session is and all the other workshops and products I have. So Beautiful. thank you. I'm going to recommend that book to my mom. My mom is going through a divorce right now. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate you being on the show and all that you've been able to share. It's, it's absolutely remarkable what you do. You have such a unique path of purpose that you're walking and you're treading it so gracefully and so guided by you know by god um by a power that's much bigger than we can f ever fully understand and um I i'm just really blessed and humbled to be a part of that path uh today getting to learn from you and share this and perhaps in the future we can do some cool stuff together yeah and really um keep going with your mission with helping people with purpose because again Getting the word out into the world is really important. And this, the whole platform of podcasts is so great for easy mm -hmm. access to so many people. It's really wonderful. Well, especially now when, you know, during COVID and so forth, to, to be able to access a podcast, to get some learning and, and is wonderful. So mm -hmm. it's good. Thank you. That's true. Well, thank you so much, Kim, for being on People of Purpose. It was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>